Okay, uh, let's get started. I entitled the message today, Jesus, Our Advocate. Jesus, Our Advocate. We're back in the Living Story series, which has been just this journey through God's entire word from beginning to end. We started in January. We've ended up here in October, uh, and we're reading through the entirety of Scripture together, and I'm preaching in tandem with that reading schedule. And so we've landed in the Gospel of John this week. I want to be in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Uh, this is a scene where Jesus actually meets this woman who is caught in public promiscuous sin. And what's interesting about this scene is that she has like many accusers that who are against her, who uh, have witnessed this sin, who have identified her as a sinner, and who have immediately cast all this judgment and condemnation uh, over her. But then she also has one advocate. One person who, who, who met her in her brokenness, in her shame, in her pain. One person who showed her mercy and grace and compassion, and that was Jesus. And I got to tell you, I think this is an important scene, a story for us to really dive into, to study uh, and to understand, because in our own sinful nature, in you know, in the time that we live in, in the culture that we live in, I think it's... Uh, you know, it can be our tendency to take the position of an accuser. In other words, it's our tendency that when we see someone doing something wrong or when we see a sinful action of others, we, in subtle ways, we cast judgment or, or we show anger instead of compassion or we get offended instead of showing mercy. And so what we'll see here in this scene is Jesus, he actually gives us as disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus, he gives us this example to follow. He shows us what to do. He helps us recalibrate our attitudes as Christ followers. And listen, we're going to learn uh, two different principles here. Principles that deal with our own sin and principles that deal with God's mercy. And I think it's these principles that affect us from the inside out, that affect us inwardly, like in our own hearts and in our own soul, and also outwardly, and we'll see why. It's all for the sake of others. So John chapter 8 is where we're going to be. Let me, um, before we jump into the text, let me give you just a little uh, clarity and context here. It's a really unique piece of scripture. In your Bible, the scripture actually might be italicized or there may be a footnote beside it that says something along the lines of like missing from the earliest Greek manuscripts. Now, what that all means is that it's, it's highly unlikely um, that this story was actually a part of John's original gospel, that it was a story that was entered in in a later edition. In fact, what I read this, uh, this week as I was studying is that the ancient church, the ancient fathers in our church, they didn't recognize this specific text until around uh, the 10th century AD. Uh, and it's because of that that many you know, different biblical scholars, historians uh, that really specialize in, in, in the Bible, they question the authorship of this particular story. Like, did John really write this? They question the placement of the story. Like, should it be in the Gospel of John or should it have been in the Gospel of Luke? And they question the timing of the story too. Like, when does this actually take place in Jesus's ministry? And so, yes, there is like, there uh, is some uncertainty here when it comes to John 8, 1 through 11. But uh, aside from, or however, because of all that, or in, you know, in the midst of all that uncertainty, you know, scholars still believe that this is an authentic story. They, they believe that it's a real story, that it really happened. And I think there's many reasons for that, but one primary reason as we enter in here is understanding that no doctrine has uh, been altered or threatened in any way. Uh, it's really important that we see that, that this is a story that perfectly aligns uh, with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story and the biography of Jesus. Th this is a story that perfectly aligns with the character and with the nature and the teachings of Jesus. If anything, I think it just reinforces all of that. And so as we enter in, without further ado, let's just jump in to John chapter 8, starting at verse 1. It says this, Jesus 
returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. And so the scene is set here, right? The, uh, this was possibly during a large religious festival uh, in which like thousands of people from around the region would have come into Jerusalem for this festival. So in Jerusalem, there could have been thousands and like hundreds of thousands of people. So you can imagine Jesus at the temple and this large crowd, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people gathering around Jesus to hear him teach, to hear him preach. It says in verse three, as this crowd had gathered, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Now, let's just pause and remember who these Pharisees were, these religious leaders who were also attached to these Pharisees. This was a group of people. Uh, uh, this was a, a religious party that was devoted to the rigid adherence of Mosaic law and all of tra the traditions attached to that law. Like they studied God's law. They taught God's law. They were fully immersed in God's law. But what's important to understand is that it wasn't out of an act of love. The, the Pharisees were immersed in God's law, not, not out of worship, wholehearted worship to God, but it was all about achieving righteousness. It was all about intellectual assent. It was all about works-based justification. And so because the law was so important to the Jews, because it was central to uh, you know, Jewish life in general, it was these Pharisees, um, these religious leaders that held all this power and this prestige in the community. Uh, and it was also these Pharisees who were most opposed to Jesus. Most of them were just, they, they hated Jesus. Um, they saw Jesus as a rival. Um, they, they, they saw Jesus as a lawbreaker, as uh, someone who was demon-possessed, who was a renegade, who was an imposter. When Jesus claimed that he was, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah, they, they called that blasphemous, uh, sacrilegious. And so they wanted nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with his ministry. They wanted to destroy his ministry, ultimately to kill him. And so at some point while Jesus was teaching there at the temple, someone uh, witnessed two people and caught who, two people who were in the middle of committing the sinful act of adultery. Which, which, which there is some irony here because what the law told the Pharisees was to arrest both the man and the woman. But what you see is the Pharisees, they only brought the woman to Jesus, which means one of two things. One, that either the guy got away or two, that they let the guy off the hook, which I tend to believe, which would highlight just, you know, the Pharisees uh, chauvinism and their, you know, prejudice towards this woman. Either way, you know, according to the law, Adultery was, it was a big deal. Jesus knew it, the Pharisees knew it, the crowd knew it. The consequence of adultery, which was clearly stated in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Deuteronomy, was death. It was the death penalty. And so they brought this woman, and it says in the second half of verse 3 that they put her in front of the crowd. And so I want you to just imagine what that would have been like for that woman in that moment. Imagine the humiliation. Imagine, imagine the shame she felt. Imagine the fear as she was caught red-handed in this, you know, public promiscuity. As she was, uh, you know, probably barely clothed in the middle of this large crowd who was all staring at her as she was facing, you know, certain death. She was put in front of the crowd. It says in verse 4, Teacher, the Pharisees said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses says to stone her, that she deserves the death penalty. What do you say? Verse 6, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. And so what you see behind there is like, behind this makeshift trial is the real purpose of uh, here, which it wasn't about God. It wasn't about God's law. It wasn't about justice. It wasn't about this woman. It was about trapping their rival, Jesus. That this woman happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong 
time, caught doing the wrong thing, and so she was used as a means to incriminate Jesus. Because if Jesus uh, replied to these Pharisees and said, look, don't stone her, then they would accuse him of violating Moses' law, right? Uh, if, if Jesus would have responded to them by saying, okay, kill her, stone her, they would have uh, reported it to, uh, they would have reported it to um, the Romans, got Jesus in trouble with the Romans because the Jews weren't allowed to execute anybody on their own. They had to go through Roman authorities. And so all eyes, imagine, all eyes were just fixated on Jesus. What would he do? How would he respond? What would he say? You can imagine, just imagine the tension like in that moment in the air. Imagine just the crowd, like dead silent, just looking at Jesus and this woman on the ground. You can imagine the Pharisees, you know, standing over this woman, holding their stones uh, in their pride and in their arrogance, in their hatred, in their indignation. You can imagine this woman just like, you know, fearfully curled in a fetal position, just weeping for her life, weeping in the dirt and the dust. It's in that moment that Jesus, he responded to the Pharisees, second half of verse six, it says, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer so he stood up again and said to the Pharisees, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. That's important. Let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Now, listen, everybody wants to know, what did Jesus write in the dust? Like, what was he writing in the dirt? It's impossible for us to know. There are a couple of different theories. One is that maybe he, he knew the sins of, his, of, of her accusers, and so he was writing out the sins of the Pharisees. Or maybe he you know, was writing out something to remind them of the higher considerations of the law, which was to show mercy, which was to show compassion. Whatever he was writing in the dust, the author didn't think, you know, he didn't deem it important for us to know. But what he did think was important for us to know is what Jesus said where he says, all right, don't, you know, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone, which is significant for a couple different reasons. One is that, you know, this shows us that Jesus, he wasn't ignoring the law. Like he was upholding the law. He was confirming uh, what the law said. But at the same time, he was also uh, uh, signifying the importance of forgiveness, the importance of compassion. And so when the Pharisees heard this, you know, they would have been instantly reminded that no one, no one is without sin other than God himself. And that no one except for God alone is in the, is in the position to judge. And since Jesus had already had previously alluded to himself as, you know, God in the flesh, Jesus was saying here that I alone, that Jesus alone was the rightful judge over this woman. And so it says in verse 9 that when the accusers, when they heard Jesus say this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. You can imagine Jesus sitting there on the ground with this woman, just watching from the ground as one by one the accusers' stones, they began to drop at their feet. And with each one, there was this like, you know, I imagine with this woman, each, each stone hitting the ground was like this sense of relief for her or this sense of hope. It says in verse 10, as we wrap up the story, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? This is the first time that the, the woman was actually acknowledged in the scene. Where, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now listen, I think it's easy for us to be an outsider in this story 
I think it's easy, you know, it's typical in scripture. It's easy for us to like take on the perspective of the crowd or a third party and just read it like we can't really implement ourselves into the story. But I think if we're being honest with ourselves, I think we can see ourselves in a couple different characters here. One, I think we can see ourselves in the character of the woman, of this adulterous woman, because like the woman, the Bible says that we've all sinned. We may not have been caught doing the same thing she was doing, but we've all sinned, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. We've all failed. We've all been prideful. We've all been selfish. We've all worshiped ourselves in ways instead of worshiping God. And just like this woman, because of our sin, you know, we have to face the consequence of our sin face the consequence of our unholiness and our unrighteousness. The Bible says uh, that the wages of our sin is spiritual death, is this separation from God, separation from heaven, separation from fulfillment and satisfaction and joy and peace and comfort and rest and supernatural uh, hope in Jesus, separation from eternal life with God in connection to God. That's why we walk around with this void in our soul right? And so we have to face the consequence of that sin. Now, what did, the, what did the woman learn about Jesus in that moment as she was facing the consequence of her sin? What can we learn about Jesus in that moment that we can apply to our own life? Well, one is that, look, Jesus, Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our friend. Jesus is our helper. Jesus is our intercessor. intercessor. He's our advocate. You know, the Bible tells us that we, we have an accuser. His name is Satan. That Satan is the great accuser. That Satan, like the Pharisees, he sees our sin and he accuses us before God day and night. The book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 12, tells us that day and night uh, Satan accuses us before God. He says, look, look God, you see what Mike just did? Like you see that mistake that he made last night? Do you see how he hurt that person? Do you see how he was prideful? How he was arrogant? How he was selfish? Don't miss that, God. Don't, don't miss that. Hold him accountable to that. And so we have this accuser, but we also have this advocate and we have this helper in Christ. First John chapter two, verse one, second half of verse one, it says this, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, Jesus, who pleads our case before the father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Now, if we jump back into the scene with this woman, how was Jesus her advocate there? Well, I think overall, listen, he recognized her brokenness and her pain and her shame, and he met her there. Like, like in other words, he, he didn't leave her when she needed him. He, he wasn't offended. He wasn't embarrassed by her sin, by her promiscuity. In fact, he, it, it got to the point where he got down uh, on her level in the dirt and in the dust when no one else would, taking on the posture of this humble servant, meeting her right eye to eye. Uh, he, you know, when others were, were quick to judge her and to condemn her, Jesus, as he met her there, he was quick to listen to her. When others, you know, didn't care, Jesus loved her and cared enough to, to call her out of her sin, to say, go and sin no more, to put her back on the path of righteousness and holiness. Ultimately, what we see from Jesus there is that he showed her the, 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 perf the, the perfect representation of God's love, of his mercy, and of his compassion. And man, I got to tell you, I think there's somebody that needs to hear this today because you think that when you go to Jesus, the first thing that you're going to experience or an encounter from him is judgment, is condemnation, uh, and is accusation. But that's not what we read in scripture, friends. That's not what we see in the nature and the character of Jesus. The reminder here in John chapter 3, verse 17 is that God sent his son into the world, Jesus into the world, not to judge the world, not to condemn you, but to save the world through him. Listen, it's Jesus' love that is greater than your greatest mistake, your failure, your sin. It's Jesus' mercy that triumphs over judgment. It, we see the culmination of that uh, in, in the cross. 
and in, in the empty grave, right? For, for God so loved the world that, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that uh, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, that Jesus loved us so much that he offered himself as the perfect holy sacrifice. He offered his body and he offered his blood to atone for the sins of the world where the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus came, he died, he rose to new life so that when we put our faith and trust in him, it's by grace through faith that we're transformed from the inside out that we're set free from the bondage of sin, that we're uh, forgiven of our sin, that we're filled with His Holy Spirit. And that it's through through, through His Holy Spirit that He moves us moment by moment from sin and shame to truth and righteousness and holiness. It's Jesus who is our advocate. It's Jesus who is our friend. And I think, listen, Like, we got to see this. We got to take this in because what Jesus is showing here, he's giving us an example to follow. Like, as we follow Jesus, as he advocates for us, he's calling us to advocate for the sake of others. Like, that's our calling. That's our mission. That's your purpose, to walk in humility, uh, to walk in mercy and compassion, and to love others as Christ first loved us. And I got, listen, I gotta be like, I gotta be honest with you. Like, this is so challenging for me. I imagine it's challenging for you because it's easy for us to read this scene and to pass the Pharisees off as these like evil people, like the enemy of God, right? But just like, you know, I think we can relate to the woman here. I, if I'm being honest, I think we can relate to the Pharisees a little bit too, that we may be more pharisaical than we think we are. Now, we may not be physically holding a stone. You may not be like aggressively accusing people to their face, but I think it comes out in subtle ways. Like it comes out in our pride and in our arrogance and in our attitude and in our subtle comments or our gossip or our assumption of others. Like I, you know, I, I think without realizing it, I think oftentimes Christians, we can be so quick to criticize somebody. We can be so quick to cancel or, you know, to get offended. Or instead of picking up a stone, we pick up our phones and we post and we repost like cold jabs of biblical truth. And though they're truth, it's not out of the sake of love. It's out of the sake of like self-righteousness or righteous indignation. Or, 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 you know, we, we talk behind people's back, we gossip in subtle ways, or we look down on others. I, I can tell you, I literally caught myself doing that this week. Like I caught myself criticizing and judging a group of people that I had never met before. And I gotta say, look, that's not Jesus. That's not who Jesus is. That's not who he's calling us to be. That when sin led to uh, the accusation of this woman, when sin led to judgment and condemnation of this woman, Jesus was her advocate. Jesus was her friend. Jesus was the only one who met her in her brokenness and in her pain and in her shame. Jesus was the only one to recognize that she was a daughter of the king. Jesus was the only one to give her grace and compassion even though he failed her. Jesus was the only one who loved her and who cared enough to say, look, go, get up and go and sin no more. Go back to God. Get back to God. Get back to holiness. Get back to righteousness. And listen, he's calling you and to do the same, to love each other. John chapter 13, verse 34, and I'll land here. It says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Just as I've shown you grace, you should show grace to others. Just as I have been merciful to you, you should be merciful to others. Just as I've taught you to walk in truth, you walk in truth, but you do it with love. It's truth in love. And it's your love for one another that will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I want us to close by taking a moment to just imagine a world Just imagine our city or our community, your community, um, your workplace, our church, where instead of 
being people of, you know, instead of accusing, we are advocates like Jesus here. That instead of judgment and subtle pinpointing of failure in different ways, we recognize our own sin and our own mistakes and we recognize the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness that God has given us. And instead of our own pride and instead of arrogance, we practice humility like Jesus practiced humility here. That, that we forgive as Christ first forgave us, that we show mercy and compassion as he showed mercy and compassion to us, that we are willing and intentional to meet people on their level, to get down in the dirt with these people, the people around us, to understand one another, to, to you know be so slow to speak and quick to listen or slow to be offended that instead of confrontation, Uh, It's conversation. Instead of subtle gossip behind people's back, it's praying for one another. As he was an advocate for us, man, he's calling us to be an advocate for each other, to love like Jesus, to lead like Jesus, to, to, to live like Jesus, and to bring others up, to lead others to do the same. Will, will, will you be a person? Will we be a people in our home and in our classroom, in our workplace, on social media that's known for our judgment? Or will we be a people who is known for mercy, for the grace of God, for the love of God? Will we be known as the light of the world, people who are representing and being the hands and the feet of our Savior, Jesus? Jesus is our advocate, and he's calling us to be an advocate for the sake of the world. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for this challenge and for your word today. Lord, I I repent of all the times that I failed. I repent for... You know, those moments where I am quick to criticize, I'm quick to judge, I'm quick to talk behind somebody else's back and not even realize it, God. But I thank you for highlighting those places and those spaces in my life that I need to surrender over to you and recognize that I'm not being an advocate there, I'm being an accuser. And recognize the Lord that you've called me and that you've equipped me through your spirit to be an advocate for people. And so would you help me? And help those listening to me right now. Would you, would you help us, Lord, uh, to show mercy and to show grace in every avenue, in every space, in every relationship of our life? Help us to uh, be effective tools, effective witnesses and ambassadors for you, Lord Jesus. We love you, praise you, thank you. It's in Jesus' name. All right.